you know, the history of auto insurance is quite interesting. It's something that isn't studied at business schools and should be studied because the great insurance companies of the early 1900s were, uh, you know, whether it's Aetna, Hartford, Travelers, they had these agency forces nationwide and wrote uh, what was then more property business. They wrote a lot of fire business in those days, and of course the automobile only came in, uh, you know, in, in the early 1900s. And so th their orientation was to property business, but they had this huge agency force throughout the United States. There were, there were property uh, insurance agents representing these big companies in every, throughout the country. And they had lots of capital. And now if you look at the business in 1997, something well over 20%, probably 20, close to 25% of the personal auto and homeowners business and insurance is written, uh, is written by a company called State Farm. And State Farm was started, I believe, in the 20s by a fellow in Bloomington, Illinois, capital to speak of, no agency force initially, and started as a mutual company. No incentive, I mean, no stock options, no, no uh, capital invested where he could become a billionaire if he built the business up or anything. So here this company starts without any of the capitalist incentives that we are taught are essential to a business growing, and in a huge industry becomes the dominant player, it has more than twice the market share of Allstate, the second player, becomes the dominant company against these extremely entrenched competitors with great distribution systems and loads of capital. Now I say that's, and incidentally State Farm on the Fortune 500 list of companies has the third largest net worth of any company in the United States. Number three from Bloomington, Illinois with a guy with no money in it. Now how does that happen? Well, I would say that's a subject we're studying, you know, for in, 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 in business schools because it, you know, Darwin used to say that any time he got any evidence that, that flew in the face of his previous convictions, he had to write it down in the first 30 minutes or the mind was such that it would reject contrary evidence to, to cherished beliefs. And uh, certainly there's some cherished beliefs around business schools that, uh, that might uh, uh, at least find some interesting aspects in studying how a company could become the third largest company in net worth in the country with no apparent advantage going in. There's another company down in Texas called USAA, United States, it's for the it, uh, United Services Auto Association, and it's, uh, it, it's been enormously successful, has billions of net worth, uh, loads of satisfied policyholders, the highest renewal ratio among policyholders in the country. Nobody studies that, to my knowledge, either. The people who started GEICO came from that company. In 1936, Leo Goodwin and his wife, who had worked for USAA, went over and started this little GEICO company with practically no capital. And now it's, uh, we have about 2.7% of the market and we're, we'll write uh, probably three and a half billion of voluntary auto this year. Catching a state farm is going to be very difficult, so I wouldn't want to predict we do that. I will predict that we will gain very materially in market share over the next 10 years, and uh, we'll gain materially this year. But we will, we will, we will, we have got a, we have got a very good mouse trap. I said in the report that. 40% of you would save money insuring with that. I didn't say 100% or 80% or 60% because uh, there are areas and professions where somebody else is going to have a lower price than we are. But if across the country, we, we are going, and for all classes of citizens, we are going to have a low price, the low price more often than anyone else. And we've got that because we've got low costs and our costs are gonna get lower and it, we've got a virtuous circle going in, in terms of it feeding on itself. So GEICO will, will grow a lot, but I, State Farm is, is plenty tough, so I'm, I'm not going to predict catching State Farm. <clears throat> I'm not even going to predict catching Allstate. But we'll catch somebody. And uh, Charlie, you want to say anything more? <coughs> well, I love your example of State Farm. I mean, the idea of picking some extreme example and asking 
my favorite question, which is, what in hell is going on here? <laughs> that is the, the way to wisdom in this world. And uh, it is too bad. A lot of the mutual companies are now trying to demutualize, helped by a bunch of consultants and so forth. And uh, they are not looking at State Farm. They're looking at some other model. And uh, everybody can't be a State Farm. That place got some fundamental values into its uh, operating mechanics, uh, the way it selected personnel, the way it selected agents, the way it discarded agents. Uh, it was huge discipline, wouldn't you agree, in that operation? Yeah, well, yeah somebody, you would say somebody had to do something very right. But the question, I don't know anybody studying what they did that was right. You know, they, uh, they don't want to because it, it doesn't fit the pattern. And, and uh, you know, when something like a state farm happens in this world, you should, you, should try to get, you should try to understand it. When something like a GEICO happens in this world, you should try to understand it. In 1948, I think it was two-thirds or three-quarters, I think it was two-thirds of GEICO was for sale because it originally backed these two people from USAA died. And so the state had the stock for sale in 1948. You couldn't sell it. That's how Ben Graham ended up buying it <clears throat> for Graham Newman because they hawked it all over for six months. They went to all the big insurance companies and the insurance companies who could see this company on a very, very tiny scale offering a, a product for way less money and making lots of money doing it, they simply couldn't shake themselves loose from the myths of the past to uh, to step up and buy it. They could have bought it for a million two hundred thousand dollars, as I remember, you know, and owned the whole company. Uh, and instead, they've watched their own distribution system get get their heads beaten in, you know, over the years. And uh, uh, all the time, you know, with these ideas from the past. So you have to be very careful to uh, to uh, look hard at what's really happening. You know, as Yogi Berra said, you can, you can observe a lot just by looking. And, uh... <laughs> okay, zone one.